This is your traditional wax candle. Eh, boring. This is also a candle, just a lot cooler. A hidden gem of high voltage electricity is the flame discharge. It's hard to determine who birthed the idea first, either the Soviets or the United States, but this idea first popped up in the 1920s. Who ultimately discovered it doesn't really matter though, because flame discharges are so interesting. I can't stress that enough. They're a form of high frequency, high voltage discharge that can be hard to distinguish from actual fire. In fact, small flame discharges resemble a small candle flame. Well, with the help of my friend Leon from the Tesla Undemir YouTube channel, I'll be making my own plasma generator capable of not only a plasma flame, but also wireless power transmission at the same time. And you can bet they'll be acrylic. If you're new, you won't get it. This basically is an electrical replacement for fire, except it goes a step further. It's totally silent when operating and being high voltage in nature, it's attracted to a grounded object. So fire that's attracted to you. Sounds legit. This candle's powered by 16 to 32 volts at about four and a half amps. The flame discharge you see results from a class E 10 megahertz oscillator. That means the electricity bounces back and forth 10 million times a second, which permanently ionizes the air into a flame. Being high frequency, high voltage AC, it's able to wirelessly light a variety of bulbs and tubes from several feet away as well. It also apparently cooks walnuts. Now, ultra high frequency circuits like this aren't exactly my forte, so to speak. And that's where Leon comes in. He's basically a modern Tesla, sounds like Schwarzenegger, and specializes in flame discharges. So we sat down for a quick Skype session to kind of hash out the finer details of how exactly to build this. So like, how long have you been building? Um, okay, I think I built the first plasma flame generator in winter 2016. Yeah. But my device was very bad and I produced a one centimeter flame but it's so awesome because you don't use a tube, you use a MOSFET and they're so small and tubes are so big. And everybody is building a plasma flame generator with tubes, but with MOSFETs, I think mm -hmm. only a couple of people do this. Before you, all I ever saw was like a couple of Russian channels that used yeah. like the good old Russian yeah, vacuum tubes. So it's kind of cool seeing it with like the MOSFET style and whatnot. But this is my prototype so far. And it looks good. <laughs> it's like falling apart, the secondary coil, because <laughs> I don't. When I put the circuit together, any design considerations or anything that I should be careful about when I'm building it to make sure that it works? Okay, for this circuit, um, it's absolutely important that you tune the circuit right. And for this, we have three different options. And the main, the main component or the main part of the circuit is the LC oscillator. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, this oscillator generates a specific frequency and you can change the frequency by, for example, increasing the number of currents of the coil. You can change the thickness of the wire. You can, you can stretch the coil, but you can also increase or reduce the capacity of the capacitor stretching it or um, using thicker or thinner wire. And by stretching it, you mean like physically making the, the resonator coil taller or shorter? Yeah, yeah okay. exactly, exactly. When it comes to the potentiometer in the circuit as well, like that, what exactly is the purpose of the potentiometer? It's very important to, to generate uh, uh, yeah, a voltage of maybe 5 to 10, 12 volts at the gate, because when mm -hmm. there is no voltage on the gate, the circuits don't start oscillating. Like a voltage divider then, sort of? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The xenodide is for uh, to, yeah, to be safe, yeah, that the voltage is not getting higher than 12 volts because then the MOSFET will die. <laughs> will blow up, so it's kind of like a, like a fine line of it yeah. like working yeah. and then like blowing up. Okay. And the position of the coil is uh, very important. Today I figured out some, some new combinations and it works much better when, when you put the primary coil a bit uh, to a bigger distance. Uh, yeah. We formed a pretty clear plan on how to proceed, so I went ahead and started the build. Little did Oblivious Jay know, building it wasn't even half of the work. The parts list, which is pretty minimal, follows this schematic. Now 
my prototype build of the circuit, which you just saw, oh, it was kind of like a biblical mess. Uh, somehow it still worked though, and I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, not quite up to plasma channel standards, so I had to fix that. Kicking off the final build, this entire unit was designed around this super aggressive heatsink that I found designed for high powered LEDs. I drilled and tapped four holes around the edge and three holes for MOSFET connections. On the underside is the MOSFET bolted into place. It's there for easy repair. Next, I placed all the components on a perf board. Being a perfectionist, I wanted everything symmetrical, centered, and easy to access for repairs, which was a good decision. These components are wired exactly as called for by the schematic. So for a precise step-by-step -step build of the components, go check out Leon's video on his channel. Then I drilled four matching holes in the board and bolted it onto the heatsink. The MOSFET was then soldered to the circuit as well. Then came the infamous acrylic. This upper support houses the primary coil and the main resonator. The primary coil form is five and a half centimeter wide tubing, the platform a 10 centimeter disc, and an acrylic ring in the center with a one inch inner diameter. The ring acts like a socket for the resonator, which is pretty cool. Speaking of resonator, it's 160 turns of 0.5 millimeter wire wrapped around two and a half centimeter acrylic tubing. The last two holes were drilled to allow for connections from the board to the primary coil, then the base of the resonator wired to its respective connection. Five turns of 1.3 millimeter wire make up the primary coil, which is designed for easy removal. Finishing off the build is a bolt for a breakout point. Oh, I also placed a switch between the power connections and the circuit. I'm loving how the design came together, and the build only took a couple of hours. Tuning it and tweaking it, on the other hand, oh, took dozens of hours. I'm not even kidding. You see, the goal is to get both the resonator and the oscillator resonating at 10 megahertz. And as Leon pointed out, this circuit kind of has to walk a very fine line in order to operate. And if you fall on either side of that line, you either blow up components or the circuit hardly works. So this is the journey that I took to exchange my sanity for a candle. My first design used a one and a quarter inch wide resonator form with 0.8 millimeter wire, 2.2 nanofarads across the MOSFET, and six turns on a compressed primary. Connecting it to power and switching it on, nothing. Adding an additional 2.2 nanofarads across the MOSFET and it lit up fluorescent tubes, but that was about it. This indicated though that oscillations were present, just mismatched. I then tried a second resonator, one inch diameter, 0.4 millimeter wire, two and a half inches long. This produced a half inch flame and I got super excited. A four turn primary. This killed the oscillations altogether, no flame. I tried raising up the primary and lowering it down, same result. A five turn primary. Oscillations at 10.5 megahertz and an aggressively fuzzy flame. Stretching or compressing the coil changed how feathery it appeared. A seven turn primary. The frequency dropped to 8.3 megahertz, and it produced a super hot arc, but no flame. Stretching or compressing it only seemed to adjust the intensity of the arc. Settling back on six turns, the frequency held steady at about 10 megahertz, and I was back to square one with a half inch flame. I then tried a third resonator, one inch diameter, 0.5 millimeter wire, three and a quarter inches long. This produced a three quarter of an inch long flame that was super awesome, like it, it already looked like a candle. Running through the same primary coil variables, I tried four, five, and seven turns. And five turns lowered down produced the biggest flame by far. With five turns on the primary and the third resonator working best, I focused on optimizing the primary height. I stretched it fully, I stretched it partially, I moved it up a little bit, and I moved it up a lot more. I was losing my mind. On my final brain cell, I found that five turns compressed and raised three quarters of an inch was magic. I turned it on, and <laughs> no, actually check this out. Four to five centimeters long or inch and a half to two inches long, super hot. And adjusting the input voltage changes the flame size. I kept killing MOSFETs though. So I tried five different inductors of different shapes and designs and finally settled on 20 turns of 0.5 millimeter wire for the final inductor. And I haven't killed a MOSFET since. Having an oscilloscope also helped to work out the kinks, so a massive thank you to Daniel from Keysight for the scope and to Electroboom for the referral. Okay, so Leon is the de facto expert on these plasma flame circuits, so I'm gonna let him talk a little bit about how this circuit works. 
So guys, I will now tell you briefly how the plasma generator works, or rather why it can work with MOSFET at all. Because MOSFETs hate high frequencies, 10 MHz are nearly impossible for them. The main part of the circuit is a simple LC oscillator which has a specific resonance frequency. The frequency depends on the dimension of the coil and the capacitor, for example 10 MHz. If we now add a resonator to the oscillator, it will be excited to oscillate if it has the same resonance frequency. At the upper end of the resonator such high voltage is built up that a plasma flame is generated. The higher the frequency, the more the lightning becomes a flame. But why can MOSFETs switch such high frequencies? Also they are not made for it. The keyword is zero current switching. So that means that the MOSFET always switch at the point where is no current flowing through the oscillator. This is super efficient and the MOSFET has no problem with it. Unfortunately, zero current switching is not so easy to set because the circuit must be optimally tuned for this. Taking all that theory and smashing it into a package like this results in this. A flame made of pure plasma, hot enough to melt steel. It also puts out a wicked strong EMF field that can light up light bulbs wirelessly. Pretty much the only candle that lights your lamp for you. Flame size can be adjusted with the turn of a knob, and the thing is just freaking beautiful. It's the perfect little candle that never runs out of wax, and it's great for a lot of stuff, like a romantic date with somebody that you love. Somehow you always get me. <laughs> How's the salmon? A quick note, I'm aware that some other YouTubers, <coughs> Styropyro, have made some freakishly large flame discharges before. Uh, they have amazing videos about them. However, I really like my limbs, and something about the prospect of vaporizing an entire handoff uh, doesn't seem very appealing to me. So I prefer this smaller size for now. And speaking of safety, the flame is made of plasma, which is much hotter than fire, so if you ever happen to build one of these, don't be this walnut. It's also always a safe bet to use the one hand rule at all times. Hands down, I think this is my favorite project and hopefully you learned something new from this video. If you have any suggestions for design improvements or any questions, drop a comment down below. And also, a massive thank you to all my Patreons for helping me to afford blowing through this many MOSFETs. This many MOSFETs is not cheap. <laughs> um, also, thank you for taking the time out of your day to watch this video. Until next time, you stay classy, you classy cats. Thank <laughs> you.